podcast, Alex and Andrew here. Uh, it's Inside iOS Dev. Today we're going to talk about uh, Sandy Matt's book called uh, Practical Objective Oriented Software. Oh, wait, wait, Design in Ruby. And uh, you might be wondering why, you know, Ruby on an iOS podcast, and we'll yeah. get into that. Uh, and we're going to talk specifically about uh, unit or testing chapter, I guess. Yes, the last chapter. Right, the last chapter of the book, which is a very, as you said, dense and... It's different. very dense. It could yeah. have been a book on its own, basically. Um, yeah, but it has a lot of ins- a lot of important things in there yeah. uh, that, are, that are very helpful, f- helpful for well, any developer, really, not only Ruby people. Yes. And this is why we're talking about it. Uh, but anyway, let's start with, uh, well, again, right, the, the book is uh, Practical Objective Oriented Design in Ruby by Sandy Matz, and she is a very well-known figure in, uh, in Ruby community. Yes. And she knows a lot about, well, OOP, right? Object-oriented programming. Programming. Uh, right. So, yeah. And uh, so you recently, Andrew, he, he was, he's been reading the book for the last, what, months, right? Maybe. <coughs> Two days. <clears throat> no. <laughs> no, last month. Yeah. <laughs> so can, can you maybe give us an overview, a brief overview, what it is, what, what it's all about, I mean, besides the title? Uh, the Complete Guide to Writing More Maintainable, Manageable, Pleasing, and Powerful Ruby Applications. He's reading from the back of the time. Uh, I cheated. <laughs> this guide will help you understand how objective, object-oriented programming can help you craft code that is easier to maintain. Basically, um, this is a book about designing object-oriented applications. Right. Um, with examples. With the, so, yeah, with, the, with co- uh, code examples. Um, so... Uh, she'll start off like with a naive solution, some like simple class, and like show like the evolution of the application as new requirements come in, and be like, oh, like this is not working. We need to uh, use this technique instead. And then ninety percent of the book is that. And then at the very end, she's like, oh, by the way, you need to write tests, right? Because you want to make sure your software your application still works as expected, right? Right. So then the last 10% is about testing, which is an entire topic in itself. Um, So that's why I was saying, like, yeah, this could be a book in itself. And it was pretty dense. I actually had to stop midway through the chapter um, to watch one of her talks to help, uh, uh, you know, clarify Mm -hmm. some of it more, which helped a lot. Um, So, yeah, that's that's the overview of the book and more specifically the, the testing chapter. Right. And the reason we, well, you kind of found that book. I mean, we keep talking about it around the office, right? It's like, oh, I, mean, I guess our Ruby developers and myself. The back end is written in Ruby. But and we have a lot of, yeah, we have Ruby developers here, obviously, then. And uh, it's been recommended by you, Thomas. Oh, yeah. Several people. Yeah. yeah. And for me, you know, I, I have a Ruby and Rails uh, experience as well. And uh, for me, that was one of those books that uh, was eye-opening, actually, in many ways. So, uh, yeah. And again, uh, Ruby, it doesn't matter really what, it could have been Java or any other language. And like I'm currently reading uh, Refactoring by Martin Fowler, which is has Java examples. But at the end of the day, what matters is concepts and... Uh, Ideas and principles and yeah. that, that they're talking about in those books. Oh, cool. So unit tests or tests, what are they, right? Why they matter? Did she mention anything? She did, and I don't. Um, let's see. Uh, unit tests basically are testing at the object level. Right. And then in the book, she differentiates from unit tests. Um, I think the only other one she mentions is integration tests. Um, so she says, like, this is not about integration testing. This is about unit testing. So, or not on the object level, but on the class level. So you test basically the class to see if it's working correctly. And I guess the difference, the main idea and difference between unit testing and uh, integration testing is that 
well, I guess in it in their names, the, the the core of it. With integration, you test the whole integration, how the system integrated throughout. Uh, I guess the integration all, of the whole it, it's system. whole, yeah. yeah. How and, it works together, right? And with unit tests, it's individual units of your system that you are testing and verifying that they work. I think the analogy she used was like a biological system. Like you can think of the unit test as like the cells. All the cells have their own little jobs and these tiny little mm -hmm. little units. Uh, and then you have the or organism itself, which is made up of like a whole bunch of those cells. And from these simple things, you get complexity. And so the unit test is saying like, let's test a cell. And the integration test would be testing the entire organism. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, what, <laughs> the interesting thing though is that, again, right, even though all of the examples are in Ruby, uh, it is still useful for iPhone developers and iOS developers, uh, and Objective-C, who's, who's working, who are working in a, with Objective-C or Swift, it's still useful to read and kind of, again, understand the con concepts she's talking about. So what are you, with iOS world though, the problem usually in the community is that tools are not there and uh, Ruby community embrace TDD, test-driven development. Right. Uh, but uh, as far as I can tell, I see that slowly but surely uh, iOS community kind of starts to, you know, get to TDD. Yeah, and start to do it more. It's harder with Swift in some regards, but right. it's less dynamic. And and one of the reasons why with Objective C it's easier because it's uh, closer to uh, Ruby's duck typing in some sense. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, the the main thing is that the software, the best practices building software is that it should be tested. Right. Uh, maybe not 100% coverage, and we take a different approach our, ourselves uh, here at Vanilla, building our app, right? Where we're like, well, we obviously don't test everything, and we pick and choose what exactly to test. Right. But that's, I guess, a different conversation. Uh, but what? back to the chapter, right? What are the main takeaways for you were from that chapter? Kind of talked about it today. <clears throat> we talked about it this morning, um, but I I also was not being recorded and I right. pressured, we should have. pressured by that, so. Um, so I guess the one thing I can recall is that in that video that you said would help to oh, understand right, yeah. the chapter, she yes. had this um, table yeah. with... Um, <clears throat> I guess things that are testable, and then she said, oh, you should test this stuff, but should not test the other stuff. Yeah, so basically, actually, this is probably one of the main, main, the main, main takeaway. Um, mm -hmm. In the talk that I watched, she has this table, and unfortunately, the table, I'm pretty sure it's not in the book. Um, it's not in the book. But the table has, on one access, it says where the message is sent. So a message could be sent uh, outgoing. It can be sent to self. Or it could be... But by message, you mean... Whoa, 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 hold on. By message, you mean uh, mess, uh, methods called yeah, on method objects. Yeah, methods called, basically, right? on objects. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you could be sending a message to self. It could be outgoing or it could be incoming. And this is all within the context of a class. Um, so those are the three places that the message, message could send. Um, and then there's two kinds of messages. There's a query and a... Um, command, I believe. Command, yeah. Command message. So then now you have this grid. Uh, and, 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 uh, and one in one case, query uh, method right. will, well, it, it is what it, it does what it says, right? It queries something, some data. So basically it returns something. And a command one, as far as I recall, it's the one with side effects. Quote it has side effects that other objects can observe. So I think the example she gives is like writing to a database or something like that. Mm -hmm. Now other objects who are reading from that database will observe that side effect. Right. If they are observing the database. Right. If they're observing the database, correct. Right. Um, and uh, 
Sorry, you were saying that. Yeah, so, form? and then so now we have this grid of three by two, which creates six little squares on there. Uh, I and you should get a screenshot or something of that. Yeah, it's it really helpful. Um, and basically, she says uh, messages, messages sent to self, uh -huh. you don't. Um, so the private methods, basically. Yeah, private methods, you don't um, test. test. Mm -hmm. And mess outgoing messages that are query messages, you do not test. Um, oh, that's interesting. And then you test um, outgoing command messages. Right, for, for the side effects that they make, most likely. Yes. Um, and then methods that are um, messages that are incoming to self, both query and command, you should test. Mm. I think. <laughs> right, Pretty right. Sure. So, okay. so that, that's three, three of the six on that grid you test. Of those like classifications of message sense. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I watched that talk myself at some point a long time ago, and uh, I don't really remember what's those specifics. Kind of to me, the rule of thumb was when you test, uh, you test public methods, right? And you basically don't test private methods on your objects. Right. It's kind of the main thing. Because really, your internals private methods, it's internal kitchen. It's like the analogy was, I don't, actually, I'm not sure if she made that analogy or, but I've heard it so many times. Uh, when your public interface, like imagine a restaurant, right? You came in, in a restaurant and you sit at the table and you about to order something. Right. You pull up a restaurant's menu yeah. and that menu is a list of methods, right? The met public methods are that menu. Right. And you select something from the menu and then uh, uh, the, the waiter or waitress take, take your order, and then they go and pass it to the kitchen. And kitchen is your private methods, right? You don't care, you don't know, and you don't really care how it's done there in the kitchen. Right. And they can rearrange everything the next day and do it a different way. What you care about is the final result, your meal that you're getting. Basically. Right. She also mentioned, uh, this is like another thing that I noticed, uh, deleting unused interfaces. So basically, she's okay. saying like, oh, if you have a method in your class and it's just sitting there and no one's actually calling that method, then delete it. Which to me was kind of obvious. I always delete methods that are in there that are not being used. Like, I guess for that, some people might be like, oh, let me keep this method around because well, maybe it might come in handy and I don't want to delete it because someone did this work. But to me, it was always, it's always been intuitive, intuitively obvious for me to delete them because like, I don't want to have to like read this code that's not actually being called. I, I love deleting code, um, so I would just remove them. Right. Um, but that was in there. Um, well, she, as far as I can recall, she had a similar note on the removing tests that don't really have any value anymore. Something about that. <laughs> I think in general... She, I don't know if that was actually in here or not, but in right, general, right. she supports removing code that's not actually useful because you just like right. you're creating like this tight. The way she describes it, I think, is like this tight coupling between objects, and like the more you have, um, your application just becomes this like tight thicket of code, and like you change one thing and it affects another thing. So if you could just like have as little code as possible that gets the job done, then that's more effective yeah right and, and it improves maintainability right basically you clear out the code and you use only only the things you need and uh, I guess if you keep things around and maybe abstract things out prematurely a unnecessary abstraction is actually worse than well a more concrete and specific thing today because you hope in the future you're gonna use it but since you don't today, it's just simply increasing complexity for you. Right, which she actually mentioned in the book in an right. earlier chapter. Um, she basically says the same thing that you said. Uh, the other thing that she also talked about in this chapter was a dependency injection. Oh, right, that's a big one. Yeah, um, so basically, I've always done dependency injection here because it's just always been the way we do things. Like I was just told, inject your dependencies. It makes your life easier. Right, and then we, we use 
at least the legacy code uses objection for that. That's like a framework to do that. Right. We so yeah. So the, the legacy code uses objection, which is a framework for dependency injection. And now we have decided going onward to just do it manually. So in the init yeah, through initializer through the initializer, we just pass in the dependencies that we're using. Um, and I guess like I've always had a hard time understanding why we inject dependencies mm -hmm. <laughs> because I really don't like I really don't write tests like um, so I, I don't think I've ever felt the pain of not having uh, dependencies injected because I, I in, in dependencies injected because I don't write tests which I know is bad which is why I'm reading this chapter which is why I've been pressured to read this chapter um, so like basically she just explains like oh when you inject your dependencies um, you can like basically configure the object like so I don't know like, if you have some class that you're testing in, like if you're passing in the one of the objects that are going to be used, one of the dependencies, then you can like outside of the test <laughs> configure it however you want. Um, maybe mock and stop. Like things. mock and stop and, and things yeah, like that. Because which, it's not the system under test, right? That's the terminology, I believe. Uh, system under test, and she uses object under test. Oh, under okay. Which is essentially the same thing. Um, and yeah, so you can like basically like configure this thing and like stick it in there. Versus like if you didn't if you didn't inject your dependency, you would have to. It just uh, sits it, there. Would, it would just sit there. It'd already be in code, like you know, be being being created by that class. So you wouldn't be able to configure it. So the way I thought of it is like, oh, you can either like just have this like if you inject your dependencies, you can just like configure it and stick it in. Versus if you didn't inject it and it was just in the class, you know, created there, um, and then it's just like pre molded. And now you cannot like configure this mold. It's just like how it is, which makes it hard to test. Right. Um, so I get like a better understanding of like why why we actually inject our dependencies. And I've been reading lately. It's also injecting dependencies actually uh, helps you, I guess, comply, conform with um, open closure principles. Mm -hmm. So o open close principles. Uh, basically, that's one of the solid principles. Uh, Solid, yeah, I don't know how they're like fully named, but solid, solid, solid something, something principles. Yeah, uh, those are the principles of uh, good, uh, good uh, objective oriented design, and one of them is open closed principle, which states that your class or your module, whatever they call it, should be open for extension but closed for modification, and. Uh, dependency injection precisely gives you that because if you have a you have a class and it depends on another one let's say I don't know what a good example on iOS is that pretty much every virtually every developer uh, builds is some kind of networking code right and let's imagine you have like uh, you build an application that manages posts with comments so you have your post service that uh, its job, its single responsibility, which is another principle, one of those principles, right? Right. Is to um, uh, get fetch those posts from the backend, and the way it does it, it needs to uh, send an HTTP GET request, right? But that request is handled by a client API client object. So with this open closure principle, uh, your post service depends on the client API client object and you would inject it. And that way, if later you ever want to change your API client, its behavior, and how it does HTTP requests, or maybe even use something else but HTTP, you would just simply inject another object of that type in the post service. And that way, it, well, it conforms to that principle, right? It's extendable, but we did not modify it because we didn't have to. Right. We just injected a new thing inside. Right. And we rely on abstractions and protocols. And I right. guess in case of Sandy, as far as I remember, she made a, I kind of throughout the book, she was uh, talking about duct typing and like interfaces, but in Ruby, the way they're, they're not, they're implied, right? They're not explicit because they don't have types that right. way. Yeah. There's no, no, there's no explicit interface. Right. Yeah. But then again, like the big one, uh, the big thing in that chapter, uh, the testing chapter that I remember uh, for me was um, t 
testing behavior of things. Okay. I forgot the way she done it, but basically she was able to kind of say that, oh, when I test this thing, it's supposed to behave like that type, right? And in that way, you, with tests, you verify that it, you know, can reply to those messages. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, yeah, basically confer, or con confirm that it works the way you expect. She actually, uh, yeah, she does that. In some of the tests, she has a uh, assert respond to. Right. So, like, in this example that I'm reading here, she has a bicycle class, and the bicycle class has an interface. So she has this bicycle interface test. So if you create a subclass of a bicycle, um, you want to make sure that it has all the, implements all the methods of that interface, you know? So in there she's like, test responds to default tire size. And then it's like, has this assertion, assert respond to that the object responds to the method default tire size. And then test responds to um, spares, assert respond to spares. So yeah, that's a way of like making sure. And I guess it's a, in a way a bit redundant for like a language like Objective-C or Swift, because you have your protocols for that. Right. But not, well, to a degree, right? With these assertions that it just responds to a method, she, yeah, literally she just checks the interface, basically, right? But I think later she even, she checks the results of that, too. And that's kind of what tests are supposed to do. They, they, they should check that by calling that method, first of all, you already check that if you can call it and compile in our case, right? That means it's already there. But the second thing you check is that the response of that thing is actually correct. Yes, she also has this test forces subclass to implement default tire size. So you have a method in the bicycle abstract bicycle class that's called default tire size. And, you, and if someone subclasses it, you want to enforce that someone actually overrides that default tire size method and then she gets like assert raises not implemented error right um so so it's yeah. the, their way of doing abstract class right yeah we kind of do the same in our code base i believe that macro we have. oh yeah we have a macro we have where if you don't implement it it crashes basically right oh uh, yeah so i guess this is kind of the long-winded overview of that chapter but a lot of, a lot to talk there about there <coughs> somewhat meandering might you might say uh, well, <laughs> <clears throat> uh, but yeah, I think later we probably would kind of bring that book again to our discussions because it kind of comes up uh, now and then. Oh, the book's really good. I liked it. Um, I would like to reread it in like a few months time. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And when we next time we'll d discuss some other iOS topic and again, right, most likely that thing will come up as we talk architecture and implementations. Yes, and I need to start um, uh, writing tests, and this was a good, uh, good primer to it. And uh, I know I said I don't write tests, but I know a lot of y'all don't either. Because <laughs> I know this iOS community. It's just so unfortunate. It's for me, it's yeah, coming from... Like, like, that's just like how I was, like that was the environment I was yeah. raised in, basically, as yeah. a up-and-coming iOS dev. It's like no one really talked about tests. Cause it was, it was hard. But now we're like now we're 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 tr you tr you're trying to get me on the train, and I I want to get on the train because I know it's the right thing to do. So. Uh, yeah, it's tools and it's the way you do it, and it's the compilations. All of that is different from Ruby. Well, I guess we'll talk about it in yes. a episode just about that. All right, guys, so uh, this was Inside iOS Dev. We will be here next time, probably in a week, yeah. with another episode talking about iOS things. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, rate, review. Yeah, to everything. A anything you can do, please give us thumbs up there, because uh, that, that would really help keep that thing going.